two philosophers stepped out of their houses and looked around. One was filled with joy because of such beauty. The other cried because of all the pain. You know, life can be a real roller coaster of emotions. We hear the birds singing, we taste delicious food or experience true friendship. And we sing along with Louis Armstrong, I think to myself, what a wonderful world. On these days, the philosopher would ask, where did all this beauty come from? What makes the world so good? But other days, we experience how tough life can be. We see news images or terrible suffering and wars. Closer to home, the loss of a loved one, the breakdown of relationships, abuse and addiction. The philosopher would ask, where did all this evil come from? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Despite amazing advances in science and technology, the most satisfying explanation comes right at the beginning of the Bible. The first book is called Genesis, which means beginnings. It helps us understand our world with all its beauty and tragedy. So let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. Welcome to session two, Creation and Covenant. So as we get into the Bible story together, the first book we find on the shelf is Genesis. Now it's worth bearing in mind that this is a book of two halves. Chapters 1 to 11 are about God and creation, so it's all on the global scale. We'll focus on this in part one. And then in part two, chapters 12 to 50, and the theme of covenant, as the camera zooms in to one chosen family. Now the other thing to bear in mind with Genesis is that as the first book in the Old Testament, it's really old. It was written to an ancient culture which saw the world quite differently to us. They assumed that the earth was flat and surrounded by sea, the sky was a solid dome or firmament, and heaven was the other side of it, you know, up there. So as modern readers looking at an ancient text like Genesis, we need to start by asking that question, what? What did this passage mean in its original context? This will really help us focus on the original message of Genesis and not get bogged down with common objections. For example, it's often assumed that modern science contradicts the Bible. Now, science is a wonderful enterprise and it's led to amazing discoveries about the universe. And significantly, Christians like Galileo, Kepler and Newton have been at the forefront. More recently, Francis Collins, former head of the Human Genome Project, is a committed Christian. So if you are a scientist or impressed by modern science, let me reassure you, there really is no contradiction. One of my former tutors had one PhD in molecular biology and another in Old Testament theology. He nicely embodied the two horizons of science and scripture and showed that they actually give compelling answers to quite different sets of questions. Modern science is focused on the how questions. How old is the universe? How has life developed on earth? But the Bible focuses on deeper why questions. Why did God create the world? Why am I here? Why is there good and evil? And though science explains so much about the natural world, it can't answer the basic questions of life that even children ask us. For that, we need to turn to the Bible. So let's read the opening few lines. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now notice that Genesis begins with a couple of assumptions. Firstly, in the beginning, God. 
The Bible just assumes God must have been there to kick the whole universe off in the first place. And that is actually quite logical. We live in a cause and effect universe. Nothing comes from nothing. Everything has a cause. As a parent, if I hear a big bang upstairs where our children are playing, I shout, what was that? And a little voice invariably replies, nothing. But I don't believe them, right? Because big bangs don't just happen. Someone must have done something. Now apply the same logic to the universe. Someone must have been there for something to come from nothing. Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God. And then secondly, this God created everything, the heavens and the earth. Now we're not told exactly when or how, just that it was in the beginning. So from the second verse of the Bible, it's just assumed that there's already matter and motion, a universe. But it's a scene of primeval chaos, formless, empty and dark. So Genesis is about how God turns a dark chaos into a beautiful world. Imagine God like a potter taking a lump of clay and moulding it. So the question that Genesis invites us to ask is not how old is that clay, but what are you making and why? Genesis then is about discovering our purpose in the universe. Now there follows six days of creation, structured by the verbs to separate and to fill. Because the earth was formless, days one to three are all about God bringing shape and order to this messy blur. God separates light and darkness, sea and sky, land and oceans. And in days four to six, he fills these spaces with fish and birds and stars and animals. And notice God creates it all by the power of his word. He doesn't work up a sweat, but simply speaks, let there be and there was. For God, word is deed. His word brings forth beauty out of chaos. I wonder if there's an area of our lives that feels empty or chaotic. Let's be expectant that as we encounter God's word, he will create beauty and purpose in our lives too. Now, on day six, God creates human beings and we are the climax of creation. At the end of each day, God saw what he'd made and said, it's good. But after making humans, he says, it's very good. Genesis is clear. God really loves people. Listen to the moment when God decided to make us. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, firstly, we were made for relationship. Did you notice something strange about that verse? God seems to be having a conversation with himself. Let us make man in our image. This is an early hint of what will later become clear. God himself is a relational being, a divine community of love. So it's no surprise that made in his image, we're such sociable creatures. God made us male and female, enabling us to make love, make babies and enjoy the gift of family and friendship. But as well as relationships with each other, we are hardwired for a relationship with God. And that is what distinguishes us from all the other animals. Not mere genetic differences, but a spiritual capacity for God. In Genesis chapter 2, God makes the physical shell of a human body a bit like a mannequin. But then God breathed into him the breath of life. The word for breath is ruach referring to God's personal spirit entering humanity. It's a beautiful picture of the intimate relationship of God with humanity, and we were made for this. And then secondly, we are made as representatives. In Genesis 1, God commissioned the first humans, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. 
Then in Genesis 2, God planted a garden called Eden and he commissioned his human representatives to take the beauty of Eden out to the whole world. We were created to be God's co-workers, filling the world with beauty. At least that was the plan. But by the time the first humans emerged from the Garden of Eden, things had gone horribly wrong. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are confronted with temptation in the form of a serpent. They have been given the entire garden to enjoy, including the tree of life, but they were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said if they did, they would die. But listen to the voice of temptation. The serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God. The serpent brings half-truths, lies and deception, accusing God of being a killjoy, robbing us of freedom and fulfilment. And Adam and Eve fell for it. They ate the fruit, but instead of light, darkness entered into their beings. Now this ancient story remains so relevant to our modern lives. We are bombarded with adverts that promise fulfilment through more stuff, more money, more sex, more fame. And social media can leave us feeling like we're missing out. It's easy to give in to temptation and seek fulfilment in the wrong places. But the very things we hoped would make us happy or popular proved to be rotten on the inside. After they'd eaten, Adam and Eve felt shame for the first time. They blushed for the first time, put on clothes for the first time. Suddenly the presence of God filled them with fear. They were on the wrong side of their creator and that's a scary place to be. So what does God do in response to this act of rebellion? This is such a revealing moment in Genesis. How I respond as a parent when my kids get it wrong reveals a lot about me. So what is God like? Well, firstly, God pronounces judgment because he is just. Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden because God will not ignore sin and evil as if it doesn't matter. He's too good for that. Sin has consequences and humanity has been facing them ever since. Cut off from access to the tree of life, Adam and Eve begin to die. But death was not part of the original plan. If you've ever attended a funeral, you will have felt deep down, it wasn't meant to be this way. And that's the message of Genesis. This world is no longer the way it was supposed to be. But secondly, God promises salvation because he is good. Against the black backdrop of evil, God immediately reveals a stunning promise. And the Lord God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He shall crush your head and you will strike his heel. Did you hear that? Someone is coming, born of a woman who will bring salvation. He will be wounded in the process, but he will crush evil and restore hope to the world. Right at the beginning of the Bible, we get a glimpse of the coming Messiah. Once out of Eden, the human race began to spread out. This happened in a region known as Mesopotamia, which is roughly modern day Iraq. And it's known as the cradle of civilization because many anthropologists believe humanity does trace back to one original couple from this region, just as the Bible says. Now in the following chapters of Genesis, humanity descends further and further into evil. So God takes action. The next major event was a catastrophic flood that covered the known earth. But once again, God's mercy triumphs over judgment. Noah, the ark and the rainbow become symbols of hope. Instead of destroying humanity, 
God intentionally preserved Noah and his family. And at the height of the flood, Genesis tells us that the waters covered the surface of the earth. Now that's the exact same phrase that was used at the start of Genesis 1. It's like we're back at the beginning again. The flood was God hitting the refresh button and giving the world a new start. So as Noah emerged from the ark, God commissioned him just like a new Adam. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, as the rainbow appeared in the sky, it symbolized God hanging up his war bow and promising mercy instead. So after the flood, a new human family stepped out into a new creation to try again. But our condition is revealed by what happens next. Noah gets drunk, passes out naked in his tent and is humiliated. The world has been given a wash, but something's wrong on the inside. The heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. That's the message of the flood. Now the last major event in Genesis 1 to 11 occurs when humans gather to build the Tower of Babel, declaring, we will make a name for ourselves. Sounds a bit like Frank Sinatra, doesn't it? Best of all, my way. But instead now of being in harmony with God, humans are competing with him. So God again acts to curb human rebellion. And the Lord said, let us go down and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Notice the irony. God has to go down just to see this great tower of theirs. <laughs> and notice the play on words. The word Babel means confusion, hence our word to babble. So God confused their languages and the one human family fragmented into competing groups. Now, interestingly, anthropologists think that the approximate 7,000 spoken languages today do trace back to about 12 original language families. That makes perfect sense of the story of Babel. And we've been living with the consequences ever since. Wars and racism and French and German lessons. So, when the philosopher asks, why is the world so good? The answer in Genesis is that God made it good. After all, when we see a beautiful garden like this, we assume there must be a gardener. This doesn't just happen. Our world didn't just happen. It's good because God made it good. But when the philosopher asks why has the world turned bad, Genesis points the finger in our direction. Human rebellion has serious fallout and we live with the consequences all around us. So, in our discussion time, let's consider the heights for which humanity was created and the depths to which we have fallen in Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Genesis 1 to 11 was all on the global scale. Creation, fall, flood, the Tower of Babel. But in Genesis 12, God's plan takes a local turn. Have you ever watched a film that had two stories side by side? A big global one and a small subplot. I think of James Bond films. They often start with an epic scene as some maniac stroking a cat is plotting to take over the world. And then it cuts to Bond one individual with flaws and weaknesses, but as he gets called into the action, we know that this individual will be the key to the global crisis, but we won't find out how until the end of the film. So with the world falling apart, Genesis 12 cuts to one man, Abraham, minding his own business in Mesopotamia, and as he gets called into the action, it becomes clear that God intends to fix creation through making a covenant with Abraham and his descendants.
But it won't be until the end of the Bible story that we find out how. So the second half of Genesis focuses on this family. Abraham, then Isaac, Jacob, and his famous son, Joseph. Now, Abraham lived around 1800 BC in the Bronze Age. He and his family would have been nomadic travelers, living in tents and moving around to find pasture for their animals. But in Genesis 12, God calls Abraham for the first time while he's still living in Ur, an ancient city in modern day Iraq. Now listen to God's call and its global reach. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's call to Abraham contains three amazing promises. Firstly, a great nation. Abraham means father of many, and here God promised him a vast nation of people, more than the sand on the beach or stars in the sky. Now this was ironic because Abraham and his wife were both in their 70s. They'd had no children. If this was gonna happen, it would require a miracle. And then secondly, a promised land. God called Abraham to leave his hometown in modern day Iraq and travel around what was known as the Fertile Crescent via modern day Syria to settle in Canaan, the promised land. This is modern day Israel, the holy land that dominates the rest of the Bible story. And then thirdly, a global blessing. God's covenant with Abraham has every human family in mind. Through him, all families will be blessed. Now take your surname and write it into this promise. In my case, it would say, through Abraham's descendants, the Ollerton family will be blessed. So it's clear that by choosing this covenant people, God has a plan for the whole of creation. It's no exaggeration that the whole of the rest of the Bible is an outworking of these promises made to Abraham. Now, once Abraham had arrived in Canaan, God made a formal covenant with him, recorded in Genesis 15. The theme of covenant will prove crucial to the rest of the Bible story. In fact, the whole story is structured around the Old Covenant or Testament and the New Covenant or Testament. Now, making a covenant comprised three main elements. Firstly, a seal. In the ancient world, a covenant was a formal agreement between two parties. The covenant sealed the deal, binding each person to certain conditions. But the shocking thing here is that God himself enters into a covenant with Abraham. This was unheard of. From now on, the God of all creation will refer to himself as the God of Abraham. He wants to be known in relationship to his people. The other day, a parent at the school gate said to me, are you Lucy's father? And I replied, yes, I am. Pleased to be known by reference to my daughter. Now, once we enter a covenant relationship with God, he is pleased to be known as our father. Then secondly, to convey the serious commitment of covenant, animal sacrifice and blood was often involved. In Genesis 15, several animal carcasses were cut in two, forming a corridor between them. Now, normally both parties making the covenant would walk through signifying their commitment. But when God made the covenant, only he passed through this corridor, symbolized as a fiery pot. It's as if God is saying, this whole thing depends on me. Even if Abraham is faithless, God will remain faithful to his promises. Now, finally, a covenant was made by a sign that marked the person out. In Abraham's case, it was circumcision, the foreskin of each male descendant cut off soon after birth. Ouch. But it marked out this Hebrew race as belonging to God. 
Now on the 9th of September, the year 2000, I entered a covenant relationship. And since that day, as a sign of my marriage, I've worn this ring, except for that time when I threw it away, but we've already been through that. It marks me out as being in a covenant relationship that I'm proud of. To be a Christian is to enter an exclusive covenant relationship with God. What a privilege. But no sooner was the covenant made, Abraham and Sarah demonstrated just how much it would all rely on God. Now Sarah had borne Abraham no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abraham, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go, sleep with my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah. Abraham and Sarah lost patience with God. For all his great promises, they were still childless and now in their 80s. So Abraham slept with the maid. She had a son called Ishmael. And some traditions say that the Arab race descended from him. Abraham is therefore an important figure in Judaism, Christianity and Islam. And in one sense, ongoing tensions in the Middle East trace back to this moment when Abraham took matters into his own hands. But despite it all, in the very next chapter, God restated his promise. Abraham and Sarah will have a child despite their old age, and the promised child will be a miracle. What was their response? Well, Abraham laughed out loud. So God said it again, and Sarah laughed out loud. But God always gets the last laugh. In Genesis 21, the miracle happens. Now in their 90s, Sarah conceived and gave birth to a son, Isaac, whose name means, you guessed it, laughter. So God fulfilled his promise just a couple of decades later than Abraham and Sarah would have expected. Now, have you noticed that God's timing is not always synchronized with ours? It can be hard when we feel that God's keeping us in the waiting room, especially as those in the queue behind seem to be called through ahead of us. But the story of Abraham and Isaac says, God hasn't lost track of time or forgotten us, he always keeps his promises. So what are you waiting for? What promises are you hoping for? Keep trusting God and we will enjoy the last laugh with him. Now, despite these moments of doubt, Abraham was a man of faith. And this is clear from a challenging passage in Genesis chapter 22, which was part of our daily readings this week. God called Abraham to take the miracle child Isaac up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Now to our modern ears, this sounds like a shocking request, and it was. But Abraham trusted that God had a good purpose behind the tough ask. So he went. And before he could sacrifice Isaac, God stepped in and provided a substitute animal that was sacrificed instead of Isaac. Then God declared even greater promises of blessing over Abraham. Now in some traditions, Mount Moriah, where this incident occurred, is the same as Golgotha or Calvary, a rocky outcrop overlooking the city of Jerusalem. This was the place where Jesus the Messiah was crucified. Abraham did not have to sacrifice his son on Mount Moriah because centuries later, God did. Abraham and Isaac point us to Jesus. Here's how the most famous verse in the whole Bible puts it. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, the rest of Genesis is the story of a nation emerging from Abraham's family. We'll see how this develops through our daily readings this week, ready for next session. But for now, one of the key concepts to be aware of is election. 
God chose key individuals forming a special thread of promise running through Abraham's family tree. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, but God chose Isaac as the promised child. Then Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau came out first, but God chose Jacob. And then after multiple relationships, Jacob ended up with 12 sons. From now on, 12 is an important number in the Bible story. As Jacob gets his name changed to Israel, his 12 sons become the basis of the 12 tribes of Israel. But what was this family like? Were Jacob and his 12 boys a model religious household? Well, not exactly. Jacob screwed up his family by showing favoritism to Joseph. Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat. Jacob's favorite must have looked like a walking rainbow and it stirred resentment and hatred in his brothers. So they attacked him and sold him as a slave and Joseph was taken down to Egypt by some traders on the ancient equivalent of eBay, but with 99% negative feedback. And yet despite it all, Joseph overcame adversity and ended up prime minister in Egypt. Now who would have thought it? Abraham's great grandson, now in charge of the greatest economy on earth. And Joseph ended up a savior figure during a global crisis. When the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe. What a picture of that early promise to Abraham, through your offspring, all families on earth will be blessed. And what a glimpse Joseph gives us of a later descendant of Abraham, the ultimate saviour, Jesus Christ. Now back to the principle of election. If I had to choose one of Jacob's 12 sons to be the holy line from which the Messiah would come, I'd pick Joseph. But God doesn't, and that's important. Jesus the Messiah was not from Joseph, the golden boy, but from Judah, the bad boy. Judah was the guy who ordered his own daughter-in-law to be executed because she got pregnant outside of marriage. And the only reason he didn't follow through with it was because it came to light that he was the one who'd got her pregnant. When she disguised herself as a roadside prostitute, he'd slept with her. And this is the Messiah's family tree. And that's the big idea. Jesus didn't come just for the good guys. He came for those who've screwed up and who've got regrets and need forgiveness. People like Judah, people like you and me. To sum this session up, Imagine this 50 pound note represents our lives as originally created. Back in Genesis 1, we were made in the image of God, created with incredible dignity and worth. But we have sinned. We have screwed up and got things wrong, and we've been screwed up by others who've wronged us. So we've lost our original dignity and instead live with guilt, and shame and regret. But this is not worthless rubbish. It still bears the image, it can still be redeemed. Through Abraham's family, through that screwed up tribe of Judah, God sent a redeemer. Jesus the Messiah came to give us a new start. He came to make us new creations. The God of the Bible is into recycling. He can make something beautiful out of our lives again. And as we'll see, the story of the Bible finishes back where we started, back in a perfect world with the tree of life. All the rubbish has been redeemed. And because of Jesus, this can be our story too. So that's the big picture of the whole Bible story. God made the world good. 
humans have turned it bad, but God will make it good again. This session has highlighted the two big themes in the book of Genesis, creation and covenant. And now through Jesus, we can enter a new covenant relationship with God. Whatever lies in the past, we can become new creations. So let's finish by reflecting on a verse in the New Testament that sums it all up. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come.